on Sunday at 1800 hours, I learned that all my telephones were cut off. I had no further communication with the outside world. A delegation had flown out to me and asked to be received. This group of individuals, on behalf of the so-called emergency committee, proposed that I give up all my functions and transfer them to Yanai, that I had been over overthrown. And now a news flash. Vice President of the USSR, Gennady Yanayev, took office from Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev because Gorbachev is unable to perform his presidential duties for health reasons. The following is a special presentation of ABC News. The week that shook the world. ABC News coverage of the attempted coup in the Soviet Union. A chronicle of reporting by ABC News as it appeared during the week of August 19, 1991. This is a special report from ABC News. I'm Karen Stone in Washington. The Soviet news agency TASS is reporting that Soviet Vice President Gennady Yanayev has taken over as president there because Mikhail Gorbachev cannot perform his duties for health reasons. TASS gave no further details. The reports say Yanayev took over in accordance with Article 127 of the Soviet Constitution. To repeat, Soviet Vice President Gennady Yanayev has taken over as president because Mikhail Gorbachev cannot perform his duties for health reasons. Good morning. Mark the date well. August 19th, 1991. Historians are likely to be analyzing the events of this day for generations to come. Military leaders and the Soviet secret police have taken control of the government and now Vice President Gennady Yanayev is sitting in the president's seat. The hardliners say the country has become ungovernable because of perestroika. Tanks are moving into the capital, taking up positions near key government buildings. Outside the Russian parliament building, crowds began gathering early this morning to hear Russian President Boris Yeltsin call for a general strike to protest what he calls an unconstitutional coup. Mikhail Gorbachev has been vacationing in the Black Sea Resort area and has not been seen since the takeover. I should just tell you that Gennady Yanayev is a veteran Communist uh, Party leader, uh, and he is a man who was selected by Gorbachev to become his running mate. He was initially rejected by the liberals in the Soviet parliament, but was ultimately voted into office. Sheila Kast is standing by in Moscow now with a report on this morning's events. Tanks from the Soviet Army's crack to Mansk and other divisions raced through the streets of Moscow along roads leading to the Kremlin. Armored personnel carriers rolled by, carrying scores of troops, some of them brandishing machine guns. Early in the morning, military vehicles rolled up to Spassky Tower, one of the Kremlin gates. There was no confrontation, but it was a show of military might. The military activity underscored the membership of the emergency committee Yanayev has put in charge. It includes other hardliners, such as Yazov, the defense minister, and Kurchkov, the head of the KGB. Civilian traffic rolled alongside the military vehicles, and pedestrians strolled past stores. But the emergency committee banned all demonstrations, threatened a curfew if there are disturbances, and took control of the mass media. Only Kremlin-controlled television remained on the air to make that announcement, as well as moves by the committee apparently aimed at winning popular support. Yanayev promised cuts next week in the price of food and some consumer goods. He promised increases in wages and pensions and a quick end to the country's housing shortage. All this may make Yanayev and his committee at least temporarily more popular than Gorbachev. If there is resistance, it may well come from the republics. The head of the biggest republic, Boris Yeltsin of Russia, called for a general strike and civil disobedience. Yeltsin said he had not made contact with Gorbachev, but an aide to Yeltsin said he believes the reports that Gorbachev is under arrest at the Black Sea. Ted? There are two Russian words with which we've become intimately familiar over the past six years that Mikhail Gorbachev has been president of the Soviet Union, leader of the Soviet Communist Party. The one is glasnost, which refers to openness. The other is perestroika, which of course refers to the restructuring of the Soviet government. Those are the, uh, the linchpins, in effect, 
uh, of Mikhail Gorbachev's policies. What do you think is going to happen to Glasnost and Perestroika? Well, we, already see, we are already seeing at least a temporary shutdown of Glasnost. The mass media has been taken over by this emergency committee. Uh, newspapers are not answering their phones. Um, clearly, Glasnost openness is, 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 is under attack. In terms of Perestroika, clearly the committee is heading to undo some of the reforms. It is talking about cutting prices, raising wages, the reverse of market uh, conditions needed here. Whether they can, in the long term, undo some of these changes, whether they can go back to the old command economy, which in many ways no longer exists, remains to be seen. ABC's Ann Compton is at the Vacation White House in Kennebunkport, Maine, where earlier this morning, uh, President Bush came out and made a brief statement and then held a news conference, and, and he, was, uh, he was quite tough, wasn't he? He was tough, and those scenes, Ted, are exactly what give the, gave the president some glimmer of hope that perhaps this coup would not succeed. One of the reasons that we have conducted our policy the way we have is to uh, encourage reform in democracy. And uh, I've said over and over again that we did not want to see a, a, a coup backed by the KGB and the military, and apparently that is what is underway. I think um, it's also important to know that coups can fail. They can take over at first, and then they run up against the will of the people. So it's too early to say, uh, but let's hope that Yanayev, uh, uh, when he made his statement, was speaking from conviction. His statement being that uh, this will not mean uh, setting back, as I understand it, uh, setting back reform and commitment to uh, go forward. Gennady Yanayev held a news conference in Moscow approximately two and a quarter hours ago. Uh, we have just gained access to that news conference, and uh, what we'd like to do is show you a brief excerpt of that conference, and I'll be talking to my colleague Sheila Kast. You should know that the response you will be hearing uh, is a reply to a question having to do with the health of Mikhail Gorbachev, because the pretext that has been given by the new ruling government in the Soviet Union for Mikhail Gorbachev not being in power right now is his poor health. I must say that Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev is now in the Crimea on holiday under treatment. He's become very tired in recent years and he needed some time in order to recover his health. And I should like to say that it is our hope it is our hope that Mikhail Sergeyevich, having recovered his health, will return to perform his duties. Now, as far as your assertion is concerned that a um, coup d'etat was carried out last night, I would um, allow, permit myself not to agree with that because we are founding our actions on constitutional norms. We believe that confirming the sort of decision we have taken by the Supreme Soviet of the USSR enables us, authorizes us to state that absolutely all legal and, as it were, constitutional norms have been observed. The first two headlines that have come out of uh, Yanayev's press conference are one that he has declared a state of emergency in the Russian Republic. Now, the Russian Republic, of course, encompasses Moscow. Uh, and it is in the Russian Republic that you just heard that Boris Yeltsin uh, is in effect saying that he is in control and he is taking over all of the Soviet uh, organs of power. So clearly there is a major confrontation shaping up in the Russian Republic itself. Uh, secondly, Yanayov has also said uh, that all but a very few select uh, organs of the media uh, are going to be shut down. From ABC, this is a special edition of World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We begin, of course, with the shock that was not a complete surprise. The coup in the Soviet Union has been on the minds of many Soviets for many weeks. There's a lot we know tonight and still a lot we do not know. It is widely believed that the head of the KGB, the defense minister, the minister of the interior, the prime minister, plus Mr. Gorbachev's own vice president, have been planning the coup for weeks, if not months. The Gang of Five, they will surely be called by many Soviets. Tonight, even though they have moved to snuff out centers of democracy in various parts of the country, including radio, 
and television stations in the Baltic republics, they are still not in complete control. Boris Yeltsin, the president of the Russian Republic, defies them and has at least a small segment of the military with him. There's been no word from Mr. Gorbachev, even his specific whereabouts are not known. It is assumed he is not free to do whatever he wants. People on the streets were stunned. A few shouted insults at the soldiers. One man lay down in front of a tank to try to halt its progress, getting out of the way just in time. Many gathered around tanks, berating the soldiers. Others countered, we need law and order. One woman shouted angrily, you are fascists. It was all too much for Boris Yeltsin. As president of the Russian Federation, he had already mounted a challenge to the coup leaders. He defied orders to evacuate his offices. He stood upon a tank surrounded by supporters. It is a coup by criminals, said Yeltsin. He called for a general strike across Russia. As to Gorbachev, Yeltsin, one-time political adversary, sought his return. They won't let us contact the president at his dacha in the Crimea. I spoke to him on Friday by telephone at his dacha. He was well, in good spirits, resting and working on the upcoming Union Treaty. Tomorrow, Gorbachev and Yeltsin were to have signed a treaty which would have given up substantial Kremlin power to the republics. In response to a Yeltsin call to defend the Russian Federation building, thousands of people took to the streets, defying the ruling committee's decrees, marching past the Kremlin and up toward Yeltsin's headquarters. They built barricades. Bus and truck drivers surrounded the building. Tonight, Yeltsin supporters are maintaining an all-night vigil, with army tanks poised just a few yards away. What appears to be developing tonight is a contest for the loyalty of the military, a contest between Boris Yeltsin and the emergency committee. There are troops loyal to both sides around the building where Yeltsin is spending the night. Peter? Jim, much of what we've heard today is from Moscow itself. What are you picking up from elsewhere in the country? Well, we know for one thing that a number of the Republican leaders simply do not want to surrender their authority to this committee. Of course, the most critical situation is in the Baltics, where the troops loyal to the Interior Ministry have moved in hard against all communications facilities, particularly in Kaunas in Lithuania and in Riga, the capital of Latvia. A closer look now at the men who have taken control in the Soviet Union, and we are reminded again that what you see is not always what you get. Before he was elected vice president last December, Gennady Yanayev had spent decades as a party bureaucrat. I am a communist to the depths of my soul. The conventional wisdom is that Yanayev is just a figurehead, with others on the committee calling the shot. Prime Minister Valentin Pavlov. Earlier this year, he charged that the West, especially the CIA, is responsible for the Soviet Union's economic collapse. Defense Minister Dmitry Yazov. Last year, he defended using troops to keep peace in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Interior Minister Boris Pugo. His Black Beret Special Forces carried out the crackdown in the Baltics last January. KGB Chief Vladimir Krichkov. He's been struggling to preserve the agency's hold on society while trying to polish its image. The men who ousted Gorbachev today have all publicly supported him in the past. All the key ministers are all pulling together as a single team. The team of Perestroika, President Gorbachev's team, and there are no grounds for any other interpretation. But all have made it clear they distrust the West and market economic forces, and their frustration has grown in recent weeks. They saw Gorbachev, at his summit meeting with President Bush, agree to deep cuts in the Soviet nuclear arsenal. They watched Gorbachev choose not to interrupt his vacation when four dozen Soviet soldiers were taken hostage by Armenian nationalists last week. They have watched Yeltsin start to implement his decree that Communist Party officials would no longer be allowed a special role in Russian factories and workplaces. And they saw Gorbachev make last-minute compromises on the new Union Treaty. It would have transferred power over natural resources like oil from the central government to the republics. It would have also given the republics the sole right to collect taxes. That was apparently the last straw. The treaty would have ended the Soviet Union as Yanayev and his henchmen have known it. Hours before it was to be signed, they took action.
It's Tuesday morning now in Moscow, day two for the Soviet hardliners who ousted Mikhail Gorbachev. They face a continuing challenge this day. From thousands of protesters and from the most dynamic and popular reformer in the Soviet Union, Boris Yeltsin. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. The president of Russia, Boris Yeltsin, remains prominently and defiantly in Moscow, denouncing the new government and calling on Soviet citizens to engage in acts of civil disobedience. The stage, in other words, is set for what could be a very dangerous confrontation. It is now just after dawn, Tuesday morning in Moscow. Standing by live in our Moscow bureau is correspondent Jim Laurie. Jim, has anything happened yet this morning? It is very quiet this morning, Ted, but there are elaborate fortifications around the Russian Federation building, the office of Boris Yeltsin. About a half an hour ago, I walked down to the barricades there. There have been public buses and trolleys that have been set up on the bridge over the Moscow River leading to the Russian Federation building. People down there are quietly observing a vigil. They feel that they are protecting Mr. Yeltsin and the Russian Federation from any possible assaults from the central government. And within the last couple of hours, additional military units uh, have switched sides, if you will, from the committee to Boris Yeltsin. We now understand that a full battalion of troops are inside the barricade near the Russian Federation building. They are in trucks on armored personnel carriers, and there are about 14 tanks. They're turret faced away from the Russian Federation building, uh, basically responding to Mr. Yeltsin's call that uh, the armed forces uh, pledge its allegiance to the Russian leader, the Russian Federation president, and not to the Committee of Eight. Crisis in Moscow. Now reporting from New York, Peter Jennings. In about a minute and a half from now, President Bush is going to come out to the White House and answer some questions about U.S. policy towards the Soviet Union. Uh, perhaps the President knows some things the rest of us do not know about what's going on in the Soviet Union. But just very quickly before we go to the White House, I want to go to Moscow and ask our Bureau Chief there, Jim Laurie, just one question. Jim, do we know today the whereabouts of Mikhail Gorbachev? We have just received, Peter, some fairly firm information from the Crimea, and we have established that Mr. Gorbachev is still in his dacha, his home approximately 20 miles from Yalta in a town called Faros. He was placed under house arrest there on Sunday. There were earlier reports that he'd been removed and taken somewhere else, perhaps back here to Moscow, but we talked to two different sources in Yalta, one his personal physician and another attendant, and they say that he is still there, although they do not have access to him. There have been some very large demonstrations in the Soviet Union today. Boris Yeltsin and the former Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadze uh, spoke to a large crowd in Moscow in which they both appealed to people there to defy the coup's leaders. There were demonstrations in some of the Baltic republics where the Soviet military has moved quite quickly uh, to try to clamp down on the independence movements there. There's no indication that uh, they've had any success. So here is the Rose Garden of the White House. The White House press corps uh, gathered. The president, as you know, returned from Kennebunkport in Maine yesterday uh, so he could get a better handle on events in the Soviet Union. And now we shall see whether or not he's going to continue to get tougher uh, with the new Express Soviet coup leaders uh, as he has in the last 24 hours. I have this morning spoken uh, with Boris Yeltsin, uh, the freely elected leader of the Russian Republic. And I assured Mr. Yeltsin of continued U.S. support for his goal of the restoration of Mr. Gorbachev as the constitutionally chosen leader. Uh, Mr. Yeltsin is encouraged by the support of the Soviet people and their determination in the face of these trying circumstances. He expressed our gratitude, his gratitude for our support of him and President Gorbachev. Now, the situation concerning uh, President Gorbachev's uh, status is still unclear. And I've twice tried to reach him by phone, including within the last hour, but have so far been unsuccessful. What kind of support are you um, able, or will you give them other than verbal? Well, I, am, I said yesterday that some coups fail. Uh, likelihood of this, it's hard to evaluate in this, in this circumstance. However, 
Uh, there appears to be very strong support from the people in the Soviet Union uh, for constitutional government, for democrat, uh, democratic reform. We want to be very cautious about this, but a tense situation has developed at the Russian Federation headquarters, which is about uh, 10 blocks from the ABC Bureau here. We received a telephone call from the office of Andrei Kozarov, who is Mr. Yeltsin's foreign minister. He is due, in fact, to go to the States to meet with Mr. Bush uh, later this week. Uh, and we are told that they fear an attack by military forces loyal to the Committee of Eight that took over power from Mr. Gorbachev yesterday. Their belief is lodged in radio communications that they are intercepting in the Russian Federation building. And they have put all of their people on alert. Now, one report that we hear has it that the, uh, the main forces of the military under the Committee of Eight would, would like to get rid of this battalion of troops that are loyal to Boris Yeltsin. There were still several thousand people outside now, but the military has just announced on the evening newscast called Bremia that there's going to be a curfew in Moscow uh, between 11 o'clock tonight, about an hour and a half from now until 5 o'clock in the morning, which has only made the people inside the Russian Federation building even more nervous. ABC's Diane Sawyer, who's in Moscow, uh, has been into the Russian Federation headquarters building in Moscow and talked to Boris Yeltsin. As you wind through the corridors toward Boris Yeltsin, it's clear his offices have become a kind of fortress. Bureaucrats who manned the telephones are now packing guns. On another floor, officers poured over city maps and talked about which streets to block with buses and trucks. Fire hoses have been pulled in from down the hall to help defend the besieged president of the Russian Republic. But Yeltsin is talking tough. So you are not afraid? This group in this room? Me? Do we show it? Do we look like we're afraid? What are you going to do? I've walked the halls here. It's empty. There are a few men with a few guns, and those of you here, and all of those tanks out there. What are you going to do if the tanks do start to roll? The defenders of this place are not roaming the corridors. They're deployed wherever needed. But you're all going to stay here, all of you, no matter what. We've been here almost 48 hours. We'll be here tonight, too. We're not going to leave the battlefield. While Yeltsin and members of his committee talk to us inside his office, a small group of amateur radio technicians down the hall broadcast words of hope to those on the outside. They said they can broadcast as far as southern Russia, as far as that dacha where Gorbachev is being held. Have you been in communication with Mr. Gorbachev at all? No, it's impossible. There is no communication with him. President Bush cannot even talk with him. Who is really running things? Yeltsin's answer was surprising. He said the coup is really being run by a collection of right-wing military and intelligence leaders who haven't surfaced yet. He said they remain in the shadows. At this point, Yeltsin's aides insisted we evacuate the building, as we did a final show of bravado from the man defiantly at the center. Don't write an obituary, Yeltsin called out, waving. We're not dead yet. Can you bring us up to date on what else uh, is going on in terms of both the city and elsewhere in the country at the moment? The latest information from Soviet radio and television is that a curfew will be imposed. It will go into effect in approximately an hour's time, 11 p.m. Moscow time until 5 a.m. It is unclear how strictly the eight have uh, made have uh, really not been obeyed. And the other interesting development on Soviet television tonight was that it was announced that Prime Minister Pavlov had fallen ill. He was taken to his bed, according to this report, ill with high blood pressure and he had been relieved of his responsibilities on the committee, replaced by an aide, according to the Soviet television report. What about elsewhere in the country, Jim? We hear to Tallinn and the Estonia, in Estonia that they've moved into Riga and Latvia. Um, the Baltic republics particularly have had military attention. That's correct, Peter. The Baltics, of course, were ripe for 
this sort of offensive by the Black Berets, the Interior Ministry forces, which which are there, and all the the pattern seems to be to take over all of the communications facilities, particularly any that could. Uh, that could broadcast information contrary to the central government. And this is particularly the case in, in the Baltics. There is one area of the country that at least so far has not been affected by a military crackdown, if you will, and that is Leningrad, where apparently the military forces are still outside the city, and the mayor there, Mr. Subchuk, apparently has been able to work out at least that troops have not entered his city. Violence around the Russian parliament building in Moscow. Could Soviet troops be on the verge of a bloody crackdown? This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Chris Wallace. Ted Koppel is heading for Moscow tonight, where this evening we got at least a first answer to one of the key questions in this crisis. Soviet forces are prepared to fire on the resistance to this week's coup, and the protesters are prepared to fire back. Early Wednesday morning in Moscow, at least three people were killed as they fought troops near Boris Yeltsin's headquarters in the Russian parliament building. At this hour, Yeltsin is still in place in the Russian parliament building, a symbol of opposition to Kremlin hardliners. ABC's Jim Laurie joins us from our Moscow bureau. Jim, what can you tell us about the situation at the Russian parliament building? Chris, it has been a very tense night there. It is now 6.30 in the morning here in Moscow. All night long, in fact, for the past 12 hours, people inside that building have been expecting a military attack, an attempt to dislodge the soldiers that are supporting Boris Yeltsin and dislodge the civilians. There are perhaps 10,000 now surrounding that building. They have violated the curfew overnight and have remained there to defend the building. Boris Yeltsin is inside of that structure, but there has been no attack. Uh, there is speculation that there is disorganization in the uh, Committee of Eight, which took power after ousting Mikhail Gorbachev. We simply don't know very many concrete facts. There are conflicting reports about just about everything. But at this hour, things are quiet, calm for the moment outside the Russian Federation building. There's still a great deal of apprehension, but no movement, no serious movement at least, by military forces supporting the Committee of Eight. Jim, as you say, there was no all-out attack. On the other hand, we have seen that videotape of Soviet military vehicles moving against the resistance barricades. And as we reported, apparently at least three protesters have been killed. How did that come about? Well, again, like so many things here, it is unclear. But it seems that four or five armored personnel carriers were approaching the area of the Russian Federation building, actually quite close to the U.S. Embassy here. They were going down an underpass uh, on what's called the Inner Ring Road. Some speculate they were simply out of place. They certainly, with only four or five armored personnel carriers, were not about to breach the buses and trucks and other barricades that had been placed across the road there. But they got themselves trapped in there. It was very plain that the soldiers were terribly panicky. They were frightened because they were being pelted by rocks and Molotov cocktails. One of the armored personnel carriers caught fire. It then slammed into the barricades, igniting the buses on that barricade. The, the soldiers escaped and then started to open fire. It is unclear how many people were killed. Some say three, others say four. Some say that at least two were crushed by retreating tanks or armored personnel carriers. But one eyewitness I talked to said that uh, the soldiers opened fire into the crowd and one was definitely shot in the head. Joining us now from Paris is the foreign minister of the Russian Republic, Andrei Kozarov, who has been sent by Boris Yeltsin as his personal representative to the West. Mr. Kozarov, have you been in touch with Mr. Yeltsin in the last few hours of this evening? Not directly. Um, we're using some indirect uh, links of communication. And what indirectly do you understand is the situation inside the Russian building after the, uh, the events of this last evening? Well, even judging from my day and, and night, which I spent at this building before I uh, 
uh, get to the West, uh, I can say uh, and assure you that uh, the spirit is high and uh, they will stand uh, to the last minute and I think we will prevail. Here are the latest developments in the crisis in the Soviet Union. At the barricades in Moscow, no peace, no war. On one side of the barricades, a human wall. Thousands of civilians protecting the approaches to the Russian parliament building. Inside that building, Boris Yeltsin, even more defiant. Is the coup committee coming apart? Reports of illnesses. From ABC News, this is World News This Morning for Wednesday, August 21st. Good morning, everyone. The threat of Soviet tanks failed to move Russian leaders out of their fortress in Moscow during the night. So the members of the ruling committee are trying a new approach, and it involves a meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev. ABC's Rick Inderfirth joins us live from Moscow with the latest details. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Mort. Potentially, this is a very important development. The Russian Federation, headed by Boris Yeltsin, has decided to send a delegation to meet with Mr. Gorbachev at his dacha, where he is still under house arrest in the Crimea. It will include the vice president of Russia, the prime minister, several lawmakers, as well as medical experts. And the twist in this is apparently the KGB chief, Vladimir Kuchkov, had invited Mr. Yeltsin to go along as well. Mr. Yeltsin declined that invitation, perhaps because he didn't want to end up in the same circumstance as Mr. Gorbachev, but Kuchkov is going with this delegation. So attention, this is quite important. About the only ally the coup leaders have right now is the weather. Rain has kept the number of demonstrators down. This morning, the barriers leading to the Russian parliament building were reinforced, but few people stayed out to man them. The Russian president has said the directives of the coup leaders will not be obeyed, and so far, they haven't been. The first night of the curfew was widely ignored, and two independent Russian radio stations continue to stay on the air. Moreover, the emergency committee's group of eight appears to be losing some of its members. Soviet television says Prime Minister Pavlov has been confined to bed with high blood pressure. Defense Minister Yazov is reportedly ill. There's even been speculation that KGB chief Kruchkov resigned, but that appears to be wishful thinking, not substantiated fact. We do have some late developments from Moscow, and we're going to go right now to Sheila Cast. Mort, the news, if it turns out to be true, would be stunning. It would spell the end of the coup. Russian President Boris Yeltsin told the Russian Republic uh, Parliament this morning that the entire eight-member emergency committee, which just two, two, three days ago seized power from President Gorbachev and declared themselves in power, Yeltsin says this entire committee is at the airport trying to leave Moscow. Secretary of State James Baker has told ABC News that the U.S. has independent confirmation that Dmitry Yazov the defense minister has resigned from this governing emergency committee. There had been reports that Yazov had resigned. Those reports had been denied, but the U.S. apparently says that they, that they are true. Kuchkov, the head of the KGB, uh, seems to be softening his position. He gave permission, apparently, for a delegation from that Russian parliament where Yeltsin spoke, a delegation from Russia to go to Gorbachev, to travel to Gorbachev's vacation area in the Crimea um, and check on him. Robert Legvolt is an expert in Soviet affairs and Soviet-American affairs. He's director of the Harriman Institute. He's in Boston. Do you sense that the coup is crumbling? It may be. It, it would be premature to put too much stock in the report of the Yeltsin comment about the eight leaving Moscow. Uh, but if they are, I would assume that means they're either throwing in the towel completely or they're headed for the Crimea in order to try to negotiate a way out of this thing with Gorbachev. But even without that, there are signs that this thing has not come together for the eight, that indeed it may be unraveling. And of course, the most dramatic manifestation of that was their inability or their failure, their lack of will last night to move against Yeltsin. That really was a, a, a critical moment for them. And uh, indications at that point that in fact, the tide had now begun to shift against them. This is an ABC News special report crisis in Moscow. Well, the crisis in Moscow appears to be diminishing, so perhaps we'll have to change the title of that special report. Start with the little things on another stunning day in Moscow. The anchor person on Soviet television, where it's about quarter to five in the afternoon, uh, apologized to his viewership a little while ago for reading the various bulletins so quickly. He said, I'm sorry, comrades, I'm very excited. Uh, his reason for excitement, of course, is that the coup in the Soviet Union 
against Mr. Gorbachev and the attempt to subdue the Russian President Boris Yeltsin appears to be coming apart at the seams. People are all beginning to turn now. Uh, overnight now, the various political leaders in the individual republics have all begun to declare themselves uh, on Mr. Gorbachev's side and on Mr. Yeltsin's side and against the coup leaders. Our correspondent in Moscow this afternoon, now quarter to five in the afternoon there, is Sheila Cash. Sheila, bring us up to date, would you? Yes, Peter, as you said, there, are, there is some exultation here in, in, in Moscow. Our, some of our reporters have encountered some of the columns of troops which are leaving. The Defense Ministry has announced it is pulling troops out of the Moscow region. Crowds have been cheering as, uh, as uh, troops withdrew, for example, from the Manej Square, one of the squares very close to the, to the Kremlin. The crowds around the Russian Parliament building, and there have been crowds there almost since the first news of this, of this uh, coup broke, um, they were bigger yesterday than they were overnight in the rain, but there has never been a time when that building, the headquarters of the Russian Republic, has not been surrounded by people. And those crowds are, are sort of waiting because there has not been confirmation that the Committee of Eight, the Emergency Committee, has been arrested. Sheila, as to uh, the Russian Parliament this morning, Boris Yeltsin is still in there and his supporters are still in there? Yes, Boris Yeltsin is still with the, with the Parliament, as far as we know, although so his... his um, his prime minister um, has left for the Crimea to, uh, with a delegation of, of some other Russian Federation officials and medical experts who are supposed to go to see Gorbachev. One other point I wanted to make when you were talking about Leningrad, in many ways the birth of the revolution, that Leningrad's mayor, Anatoly Sobchak, in the last hour or so, has gone on radio in his city to say that, thing, that conditions are returning to normal in this country. So that's another assurance that people here in the Soviet Union are getting over the airwaves that the coup is over. It's a little before 5 o'clock uh, in the afternoon uh, in the Soviet Union. And I doubt if there's any person in this country who is watching events any more closely than the recently returned American ambassador to the Soviet Union, Jack Matlock. What do you think of all this? Well, I'm very encouraged that all the signs seem to be indicating a failure of the coup. I felt all along that it would fail eventually. Why did you think uh, that? But I'm well, because I think the country is a different country from the one that the coup leaders uh, thought they were dealing with. Uh, the fact is, it's changed a lot. People will stand up for their rights now. They will stand up uh, against dictatorship, and I think we've seen that, and that makes all the difference in the world. Okay, Mr. Matlock, thank you very much for joining us. Now the official task news agency reports that the hardline emergency committee, this is uh, TASA's words, that overthrew Mikhail Gorbachev, has actually disbanded. And here's the quote, a TASS informs uh, the restrictions announced by the former emergency committee on central Moscow and regional publications has also been lifted. Let's go back to Moscow to try to get some feel of what it's like on the streets. Uh, ABC's Paul Cleveland, uh, who's one of our producers uh, in Moscow today, is on the streets uh, at the Russian Parliament building. Paul, can you hear me? I can, Peter. Uh, just tell us what it's like there. Well, it's, it's a mood of, I would say, quiet celebration. There's, there's some flag waving directly in front of the building. The remains of barricades, some of them still in place, are here. There are thousands of people milling around. Uh, no great jubilation, as I said. They just seem to be out enjoying themselves. Okay, just uh, while we're talking here, we're now looking at some of the Russian defense forces in downtown Moscow. Uh, who were ordered, according to the TASS news agency, a short while ago by the Ministry of Defense uh, uh, to return to their barracks. There have been an enormous number of tanks and armored personnel carriers in the central portion of the city uh, in the last 24 hours. There were several hundred of them that came uh, to one of the, near one of the principal airfields. Yesterday, you'll recall all of our reporting how they had moved to within one or two miles of the Russian parliament. A tremendous anxiety at the headquarters of the Russian Federation there yesterday. Uh, about whether or not there would be an attack mounted on the Russian parliament. Uh, this is an astonishing sight to those of us uh, in the West, uh, and probably an astonishing sight, or even more astonishing sight, to people uh, in this capital, which has changed so much uh, in the post-war years, but in some respects hasn't changed at all. Standing by as we wait for the president is our White House correspondent, Brit Hume. This is what the administration had hoped for, not necessarily expected, but thought was a distinct possibility that this might fail. And uh, I might mention that uh, the steps that the president took over the last couple of days did not in any way prejudice the situation so that it would be difficult for him if Gorbachev did indeed uh, come back to Moscow and resume charge. 
I spoke at length this morning to President Boris Yeltsin. Uh, President Yeltsin was clearly encouraged by the fact that he had survived another night in the Russian Parliament building without a major assault uh, by the forces supporting his coup. He told me that tens of thousands of Muscovites had turned out to help guard the building from attack. Yeltsin said he was encouraged by indications that more and more military units and their commanders were abandoning support of the coup. There are at present, according to Yeltsin, uh, flights of aircraft carrying his representatives and also others with uh, members of the emergency committee on their way to the Crimea to meet with uh, President Gorbachev. Perhaps we can talk to ABC's Jim Laurie, who is in our Moscow bureau, who's just come back in off the streets. Jim, what have you been finding? Peter, actually, I'm not in the Moscow bureau. I'm on a balcony at the Russian Federation uh, headquarters. In front of me are tens of thousands of cheering people. Behind me, the Russian parliament, presided over by Boris Yeltsin, is in session. And it is quite an elated, emotional crowd uh, right here. They're elated because they feel that it's all over. Now, Jim, you've been our bureau chief there in Moscow for several years. What's your own impression of what you're seeing and hearing? Well, it's, uh, to put it mildly, a remarkable several days that we have been through. What is most remarkable to me, because I remember back in 1989, 1988, the beginnings of the popular movement here, the campaign for democratic reform, the first election campaign, Boris Yeltsin's first election campaign, and I see that same kind of popular spirit uh, back here among the people, a feeling among people, and this crowd is a good example of that just in front of me, that they actually have a voice in things and that they can perhaps change things around. There was tremendous discouragement when they thought the military had the upper hand and that uh, tanks might uh, come against this Russian Federation building, but now there's tremendous elation here. It's 8.30 in the evening in Moscow, and after having said for a couple of days he couldn't get in touch with him, President Bush has managed to have a conversation with Mikhail Gorbachev. He will return uh, either tonight or tomorrow to Moscow. He tells me that things are under control. Uh, his first call, I believe, uh, was with Boris Yeltsin. He uh, stated his sincere appreciation to the people of the United States and others around the world for their support for democracy and reform. And he uh, sounded in good physical condition. Indeed, his voice was buoyant in his view. Uh, the constitutional authorities are back in power, and uh, democracy and freedom uh, and reform have prevailed. Tonight, Nikhail Gorbachev is again president of the Soviet Union. The men who try to bring him down are either under arrest or being hunted. We're not absolutely sure. Boris Yeltsin, the Russian president, once dismissed as a loose cannon on the Soviet political scene, has stared the cannons down and emerged as the man who's kept the Soviet Union from being plunged backwards. It is now time to celebrate. Alexei Lasaski is 18 years old, an economic student at Moscow State University. He decided to come here soon after Soviet tanks rolled into the city, but first had to convince his mother. She was very much afraid and uh, she didn't want me to let to go, to go there. So I had to a very difficult talk with her. So uh, I, I tried to prove that it's my duty to come here. She let him come, but he admits he was frightened, especially last night when he heard about the three protesters who had been killed nearby. Alexei says he was surprised that the coup collapsed so quickly. He believes Boris Yeltsin deserves much of the credit and that it was also a victory for the Russian people. Uh, we made another step on the way to democracy. Natalia Greenlow is a teacher. She and her husband arrived yesterday. We came here because we considered it to be our real civil duty to be here at that moment. When we her civil duty, a concept that is beginning to take hold in Mikhail Gorbachev's Soviet Union. Natalia believes people will be glad to see him again. They would be happy when he will occupy his place, which really belongs to him. 
Others here say they still have questions about Gorbachev. People think of Gorbachev as they did before all this happened. They still don't have complete faith in him. But there was little talk of that tonight. With the crisis over, they held a concert and called it Rock on the Barricades. It was time for a celebration. They had taken their stand against repression and for freedom. And they had won. Gorbachev arrives back in Moscow and is whisked home in the middle of the night as a new day dawns for the deposed Soviet president, for Russian President Boris Yeltsin, and for the Soviet people. This morning, Thursday morning here in Moscow, Gorbachev was back. He flew into Moscow around 2 o'clock this morning. And while Boris Yeltsin waited for Gorbachev to pay a courtesy call, a thank you for your support visit at the headquarters of the Russian Federation, the once and apparently future president of the Soviet Union was driven to his country home on the outskirts of Moscow. It has been a day and a very long night of confusion bordering at times on near madness. While thousands of mostly young Russians maintained their defensive vigil around the Russian Federation building, what they called Boris Yeltsin's White House here in Moscow, wild rumors flew through the city. Raisa Gorbachev had committed suicide. She did not. Marshal Dmitry Yazov, the Soviet defense minister and one of the men who overthrew Gorbachev only four days ago, Yazov too had committed suicide. That also turned out to be a false rumor. Word spread that elite Soviet troops were about to storm Yeltsin's headquarters. The crowds outside reinforced their barricades, while inside sandbags were brought to Yeltsin's office to protect against gunfire from the outside. But gradually, in the offices of Yeltsin's top advisors, the sense grew that the tide was turning irrevocably in their favor. Gennady Barbulis, who is state secretary of the Russian Federation and perhaps Boris Yeltsin's top advisor, left no doubt tonight that Gorbachev will have to pay for the role that Yeltsin has played in bringing him back to power. I have no doubt that Gorbachev was trying to pursue a very noble purpose. However, his personal tragedy is that he has been trying to accomplish a radical reform within the rigid framework of the communist system. This is a totally hopeless endeavor which subsequently leads to errors and even crimes. When Mikhail Gorbachev arrived here in Moscow in the middle of the night, a Soviet adventure which a group of persons has embarked upon. This group wanted to prop these people, to push these people onto a path which would bring our entire society to a catastrophe. This didn't take place and this is an enormous conquest and victory of Perestroika. Another part is that I am extremely appreciative and grateful to the Soviet people and for that principled position that the Russians have taken to the President of the Russian Republic, Yeltsin, and to the Supreme Soviet of the Russian Federation, to all the deputies and all the working collectives who resolutely took up this uh, path to combat the, this adventure. This is what we can truly be proud of. The president was blocked, isolated from the people, from the world, from its, from the, and was supposed to stand up and be steadfast. I think the goal was to break, uh, break me morally, break the president morally, to break him and to influence his family. Well, nothing came of this. Why do you think that the men who held power for only three and a half days, as it turned out, did not mobilize the military, use the military, and arrest Yeltsin right away? Well, first of all, I think that the plotters were trying to use the old kind of uh, mentality. They thought that fear is enough, that the Germans' fear in the Soviet people is so strong that they can do everything. And uh, the other reason, and it's the main reason, is that the reforms initiated by Mikhail Gorbachev left such a profound impact in the Soviet society that the Soviet people can no longer live the way they used to be live for, living for decades. But now the Soviet people have the feeling of pride and they knew how to defend themselves and defend their democracy. 
Since late last night, much of the world has waited to hear Mr. Gorbachev's version of what it was like to be suddenly cut off from the power he has so wielded for six years. When he met the world's press to discuss what had happened, it took a moment to get his composure. They had been vacationing at their dacha in the Crimea, overlooking the Black Sea. The regular dacha guard, 32 men, were on duty. On the 18th of August, at 10 to 5 p.m., I was told by the head of my guard that a group of people had arrived asking to see me. I said I wasn't expecting anybody, hadn't invited anybody, and hadn't been told of this. And why are they here? The chief of the guard said he did not know, but he recognized one among the group. Lekhanov, the head of the KGB guard, uh, showed up with him. Otherwise, the, uh, the uh, guard wouldn't have let them through. Gorbachev went to the phone to see who had sent them. I picked it up. It was, it had been cut off. And the third and fourth, I picked them up. I picked up the internal phone, all dead. I was cut off, incommunicado. Then I understood. Gorbachev gathered his family together and told them what was happening. And I would stick to my position right to the end. No blackmail, no threats, no pressure would have any effect on me. Raisa, he said, had handled it better than anyone. Gorbachev then met with the intruders and learned the details of the government's takeover. I said that you and everyone who sent you are adventurers. You're simply going to ruin you, but the hell with you. When the conspirators announced that he was sick, he was calm but deeply distressed. The doctor wrote his opinion in several copies and he distributed it so that everyone would know the true state of the health of the president. Gorbachev said how pleased they were to have found an old radio in the house. And the people from the guard managed to hook up an antenna and uh, find out what's going on. We've got the BBC, best of all. Though he was not completely clear about it, Gorbachev said that the family took pictures while they were held prisoner. This is one of them. The ordeal for the Gorbachev family lasted three days and three nights. 72 hours of full isolation ensued. This, the idea, obviously, was to break the president psychologically. It was very rough. At his news conference today, among the people Mr. Gorbachev thanked were those who defied the Soviet army and stood up in the streets for the rule of law. Today, some of those people were out in the streets of Moscow again, making it clear they want more. More than 100,000 people turned out for the demonstration. They cheered Yeltsin. They cheered Russia. And they made it clear that Mikhail Gorbachev is not their favorite. The sign reads, From Russia with Love. From the Russian parliament, they march past the Kremlin in Red Square. The streets of Moscow belong to the people today. It wasn't very long ago that Mikhail Gorbachev tried to ban large demonstrations like this. It's unlikely he will try to do that again. These people came to his rescue. And these people had a few scores to settle. They broke a few signs at the headquarters of the Communist Party and painted Freedom Freedom on the headquarters of the KGB then turned their attention to the statue across the street, Felix Durzhinsky, founder of the Soviet secret police. Durzhinsky was introduced to graffiti. Next, metal cables were attached to the statue. Police stood by while protesters argued whether to take Durzhinsky off his pedestal now or later. Tonight, they decided now was better. One elderly Russian in the crowd said, I lived through lives all my life, but I am glad I lived long enough to see this. When the hard-line leaders of the Communist Party fail to overthrow Mikhail Gorbachev, they may well have signed the death warrant for the Communist Party itself. Seventy-four years after the Russian Revolution, the Russian President Boris Yeltsin has told the party its activities must be suspended in the Russian Republic. When Mikhail Gorbachev visited Boris Yeltsin's Russian Parliament, he got a round of applause at first, but then a lot of heckling, interruption, and embarrassment. 
At one point, as Gorbachev was telling the parliament how he would restructure the government, he was suddenly asked to read aloud the minutes of a meeting of his cabinet last Monday during the height of the coup. I haven't seen it yet, Gorbachev cautioned. Go on, read it now, Yeltsin insisted. And as a clearly uncomfortable Gorbachev read, he learned that only one of the men in the cabinet he had appointed, UN Ambassador Yuri Vorontsov, spoke out against the coup. When Gorbachev announced permanent replacements for the coup leaders, it was clear they were Yeltsin's choices. Just the beginning of a government shakeup, which Yeltsin and Gorbachev say they'll work out together. In effect, if not in name, a new coalition government. But they clash today over the Communist Party. With Gorbachev looking on helplessly and the parliament applauding, Yeltsin signed a decree suspending all Communist Party activity in Russia. Gorbachev tried to argue, calling the moves against the party a mistake, because not all communists were involved in the coup plot. He said the party had as much right to exist as any other. In the end, he had no choice but to give in. They pulled down Lenin's stand in Riga, capital of Latvia. They ripped the sign off the front of Communist Party headquarters. The local Communist Party boss in Riga, Alfred Rubiks, was arrested after being named as a supporter of the coup against Mikhail Gorbachev. It is as though people in the Baltic republics who want independence from Moscow have sniffed out the disarray in the Kremlin and are prepared to take advantage of it. From ABC News, The Weekend Report, here's Jack Smith. Good evening. In the wake of the abortive Soviet coup, the trappings of totalitarianism in Russia are falling away. And today, it was the Communist Party itself, the backbone of the Soviet state. In an apparent attempt to salvage his presidency, Mikhail Gorbachev today quit as party chief and then ordered steps effectively to dissolve the party. For many people, Gorbachev's dramatic moves came much too late. As he appeared today at the funeral for those killed in the coup attempt, it was clear most people had given up on the Communist Party a long time ago. With shocking speed, the party is now being dismantled, just as the heroes of the revolution are being lifted from their pedestals. The reason for Gorbachev's resignation as head of the Communist Party was spelled out on Soviet television. Having analyzed the position of the Central Committee of the Communist Party and the Politburo during the attempted coup, we must admit that both bodies sided with the conspirators. Gorbachev, in giving it all up, also saw to it that the party was stripped of its influence. He called on the Central Committee to disband, outlawed party communists, that it was the hardest decision of his life. Nearly a million Russians came to honor the Soviet Union's newest heroes, the three young men who were killed during the coup attempt. An artist, a worker, and an architect, they died defending their republic on this spot, now and forever a shrine. An emotional Mikhail Gorbachev bestowed on them the country's highest honor, hero of the Soviet Union. I bow low to them, he said. They gave everything. They gave their lives. U.S. Ambassador Bob Strauss joined in the eulogy. Today, we in the United States of America share your sorrow at the price these brave souls paid in the just cause for which they and you fought. Boris Yeltsin, the Russian president, praised for his own heroic behavior this week, asked to be forgiven for not preventing the killings. Their deaths, he said, will not be in vain. Indeed, even as the people mourned, Yeltsin took more steps today to suspend communist activities in his republic. It is what many people here have waited so long to see. The three for the principles of democracy. John Reed, an early American communist, was also a journalist of sorts and was in Leningrad in 1917 when the Bolsheviks stormed the Tsar's Winter Palace and seized power. And he wrote the best eyewitness account in a book called Ten Days That Shook the World. Now, if he were alive, he could end a final chapter and call it about five days maybe that unshook the world. 
describing how the Communist Party came to disgrace in the country where it was born. I think today is the end of the Communists. It's quite time uh, for Communism to die in Russia and in Soviet Union too. Throughout the Soviet state this week, symbols of the old order came tumbling down. Statues of Lenin. The Felix Jusinski, founder of the secret police. The old pre-revolutionary Russian flag came out to replace the hammer and sickle. And reformers were named to head the interior ministry, the army, and the KGB, the apparatus of control. The coup has destroyed the old totalitarian empire and everything associated with it. The failure of the coup is expected to accelerate the pace of reform and the breakup of the Soviet state. The central power is going to be weaker. I don't think there's really very much doubt about that because the Repu republics have really flexed their muscle now, especially the Russian Republic. The Russian Republic, it has 76% of the Soviet Union's land mass and 51% of its population. And its charismatic leader, Boris Yeltsin, who personally rallied popular opposition to the coup, has emerged as the clear political winner. And I assured Mr. Yeltsin... U.S. policy began shifting to accommodate the emergence of Yeltsin, a man the White House once dismissed as a fool. Not anymore. Forgotten in all the week's images is the fact that during the coup, most Russians were not on the street. In food stores just 15 minutes from the Kremlin, shoppers stood in line sometimes eight hours to get basic necessities. Economic conditions are worse than in the Great Depression. Unless food gets on the table soon, reform this winter could become just as discredited as communism is this weekend. For the moment, though, the Soviet people and the rest of the world are fixed on the fact that 74 years after its birth there, communism in the Soviet Union is dying. This has been a special presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.